So we're going to spend a few moments in Acts chapter 16. You're probably at home or in the distance of a Bible, so you might find your own copy of Scripture. It is going to be on the screens so you can follow along. But I'd love it if your eyes could see this great story uh, in your own copy of Scripture. And if you are unfamiliar with our weekly Bible study, it is still online. We're not meeting in person, but we are still producing that. And you can go to crossridgecc.com and navigate over to the media tab and down to Bible. Bible study, and you can find the weekly Bible study there so you can stay engaged uh, with what Pastor Kirk's going to preach on uh, next week. I also forgot, maybe, uh, you know, I need to just go ahead and pause and go back and say, I also always thank Pastor Kirk for giving me this opportunity. I want to keep my job. Uh, I love getting to preach to you guys. Uh, but, you know, seriously, uh, it, it takes great humility for a leader, uh, a lead pastor, to share in the responsibilities of preaching the word. And it is a, it is a delight for me to be able to do that. And So seriously, I do want to thank him. But we're going to jump back now to Acts 16, and we're going to read 10 verses in Acts 16, specifically these verses 25 through 34. And there are 233 words that I want your eyes to glance over today, because it's a story of hope. It's a story that I believe has direct application to what we are all experiencing right now, what the whole world is experiencing right now. But First, I want to jump to the first two words in verse 25. They're the words about midnight. Okay, and again, if you were here with me, I'd want to know that you were leaning in and you were engaged, and so I'd ask you to say that with me. So let's just do that. Morgan reminded us at the beginning that we're still doing church together, even though we aren't physically in the same place. So would you just look to the neighbor that maybe you're watching this live stream with and say about midnight? If you're by yourself, you can look at me and say, about midnight. I've got a few friends in the room. I want you guys to look at me and say, about midnight. Thank you. You see, because the truth is, I I, I don't know how much of this stream you're going to catch today. Maybe you're outside uh, doing some yard work. Maybe you're washing the dishes. Maybe you're in the car. Maybe you're at the office. I hope you're at home in your living room with your family. But you see, uh, when I was in, in college and in seminary, my, I had a preaching professor, Dr. O'Neill, who said, hey, uh, as you design a sermon, as you write a sermon, you, you, always, you always design it around this right hook, this statement at the end that you can give to draw people in, to motivate them, to help them listen to the Spirit of God and provoke a response. And so uh, as we wrote sermons and as he would grade them, he was always looking for the right hook and and it would always have to be at the end. But you see, Dr. O'Neill never prepared me to preach to an empty room or to a gathering that's mostly online. And so I, I want you, as you lean in today, to know that there is something about this phrase, about midnight, this lens that God wants to use as we read this story uh, to cause you to begin to think about the midnight hour as an opportunity, an opportunity that Jesus wants to step in and use for his glory as you might uh, discover today your song of hope at midnight. And so that's my right hook this morning, that you have a song that hope sings loudest at midnight. And you see, uh, here's the deal about midnight. I remember as a teenage boy walking out the door a couple of times, uh, junior and senior year of high school, going to hang out with my friends. And my dad, he might be sitting on the couch or he might be in the kitchen as I would be going out the door and he'd say, hey son, come here. And I'd come and he'd grab my face and he'd look into my eyes and he'd say, I want you to remember this, that nothing good ever happens at or after midnight. And he was prompting me to come home early. And if I'd been a better student of scripture as a teenager, I would have said, hey, God, hey, hey Dad, uh, what I really want you to know is let's flip to Acts 16 because there are some really good things that happen at midnight. Okay, And like that, I'm praying that although you might be in the middle of a midnight experience, one that's trying to cast out fear and hope from your heart, uh, one that's trying to derail your attention from being squarely placed on the, on, the, on the person of Jesus to our circumstance, that you might understand that in this midnight hour, Jesus wants you to be able to sing a song of hope. I get it. Uh, What my dad was after is under the cover of darkness, teenagers get into trouble. 
I get it, I'm a student and family pastor, I spend a lot of time with teenagers. A lot of times I have to, when we're on a retreat, I have to get out of bed at or after midnight because somebody's gotten in trouble. But maybe, just maybe, as the church rises up to sing a song of hope at midnight, it would become a rallying cry for us today, at midnight. And so some of the context that you need to understand about the particular midnight that we're gonna read about here in a second is this. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, the guy who wrote Acts, they're headed into the city of Philippi. And in the city of Philippi, they're gonna minister to some people. The first person they encounter is a woman named Lydia. And Lydia is a worshiper of God, yet she doesn't know who Jesus is. And uh, as they encounter her, the Bible tells us that she's going to pray to God, and yet she finds herself sitting uh, at a location one day, and she is paying attention to what Paul has to say. She accepts Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And that's going to become really important to our conclusion today, because what we know as we study the book of Acts is that Lydia and her whole household was baptized that day. And that's actually hugely important to our conclusion. A house church, the first church that we know of in the city of Philippi, was started that day as her whole house responded to placing their faith and trust in Jesus. And then in verse 16 through 24, one other context that we need to understand today is Paul and Silas are walking around the city of Philippi as they're engaging people, as they're headed to go to prayer meetings, as they're talking to business people about Jesus. There's a demon-possessed little teenage girl that's following them around and she's shouting. She's shouting one thing and the Bible says it happens on multiple occasions over multiple days. She's shouting this, these men, Paul and Silas, they're servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Okay, and so what I want you to understand as you look at that statement is it is a statement of truth that's coming from an evil source. It's a statement of truth that's coming from an evil source. It's designed to be used as an arrow of harm to Paul and Silas. And Paul becomes annoyed. And I, I, when I read that this week, I was thinking about some moms and some dads who of little ones probably have had uh, heard uh, all too much over these last nine weeks. Is it over today, dad? Is it over today, mom? Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? And this part's just for free. You need to recognize that Paul was annoyed, so it's okay to be annoyed. Maybe just don't turn to your little child and try to cast out a demon. But that's what Paul does. He becomes annoyed, and so he turns to this young teenage girl who's being slave trafficked by some businessmen, and he says, in the name of Jesus, come out. And so she doesn't have the ability to, to tell the future anymore. She doesn't have the ability to help make these guys money anymore. And that's where we pick up in verse 25. Let's read it together. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Check it out. Paul and Silas singing their song at midnight, and it had to be that, these, that the other prisoners thought these guys were crazy. In verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately, say the word immediately to your friend or whoever you're watching with, immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. It probably wouldn't have been that unusual for the doors to fly open through this earthquake, but it had to have been greatly unusual that their, their, their shackles, that they were freed of their shackles. So we know God is at work. Verse 27, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. So he's at a point of despair. He's at his own midnight hour, if you will, because he thinks the prisoners have escaped. But watch this in verse 28. Paul begins the story of hope, begins the story of the gospel right here in verse 28. He cries out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we're all here. We haven't gone anywhere. Don't you, have, don't you realize that the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit had to be prompting Paul, stay put, don't leave. It's not your time yet. 
It's not, I'm not ready for you to go. I'm gonna do something else with this song at midnight. Then verse 30, then they brought them out and the jailer says back, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In response to, to Paul and Silas's obedience, this guy is like, yes, I, I wanna know Jesus. I wanna know the God that you guys know. In verse 31, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your entire household, your entire family can, can become like Lydia and you can start a church right now if you believe in your heart. In verse, verse 33, and, and he took them the same hour, so just right after midnight, and he washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. So it's in the middle of the night the early morning hours, and finally verse 34. Then he brought them up to his house and he set food before them and he rejoiced. So another song's being sung. He rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. You see, there are a couple of things that I want you to recognize as we process this story this morning, as we process the context clues before it and these 10 verses, these 233 words. And the first thing I want you to realize is that before midnight, right, we saw it in the context clues, before midnight, the enemy uses the loudest voice that you're listening to as a weapon. Let me say that again so you can begin to process it. Before midnight, the enemy, the father of lies, the one who's coming to steal, kill, and destroy, he often uses the loudest voice that you're listening to as a weapon, as a weapon to harm you, as a weapon to distract you, as a weapon to drive you from the presence of God. So this morning, as a believer, we gotta recognize that if I'm not listening to the Holy Spirit, the voice of Jesus, the loudest voice that I'm listening to whether it speaks truth or whether it speaks a lie, can be used as a weapon aimed at my heart, aimed at my mind to get me to take my eyes off of what Jesus wants to do in my midnight hour. And I got to thinking this week that all of our lists of loud voices right now, they're growing by the day. Right? If we're not listening, if we're not believers that are making it a point to spend time with Jesus and listen to his voice and we're listening to another voice, a loud voice, that list of really loud voices, it's growing by the day. Conspiracy theories, death count numbers, survival rates, masks or no masks debate, news outlets, Twitter, Facebook, the governor's address, the president's address. Is this place open? Is this place closed? Can I do this? Can I do that? They're all just screaming at us. When's this gonna be over? And we can clearly see the assignment of the enemy is, hey, why don't you get engaged in that discussion? Why don't you put all your eggs in that basket? Why don't you leverage that talk and take your eyes off of Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, so we wouldn't recognize our midnight hour. We wouldn't recognize our song of hope. And I don't want you to mistake that for me trying to minimize what we're all going through. Because everybody, everybody has lost so much. People have lost their jobs. People have lost their entire savings account. People have lost literally loved ones. I was, I was able to participate in a drive-through uh, celebration for one of our seniors yesterday. And you know they had an informal graduation for the families and then we all drove around as they had tables set up and honked our horns and people had decorated their cars. My guess is that you've participated in something like that. And it reminds me that our teenagers, our own children, They've been robbed from significant things, significant landmarks in their lives. So everybody, the whole world has a midnight hour where a song of hope could, can have the possibility to rise from their hearts to the heavens and we can watch God move. So I'm not minimizing anything. I got to thinking this week how um, this this whole, pro this whole thing has been a little surreal, right? As it feels like both time is speeding up and slowing down at the same time. I know for me, uh, maybe like you, I have a job where there are significant things that have to happen on each day. Sunday, like today, Wednesday, when we do our, our live stream for our student ministry, and then back to Sunday. So it feels like the weeks go by really fast, but it also feels like this has been an incredibly long nine weeks maybe even an incredibly long first quarter of the year. 
And as I was processing that this week, I realized that it hasn't even been a year yet since I went and dropped off, since my family, we went and dropped off my oldest daughter. Uh, she graduated from high school last year and she was gonna uh, be a participant in a, in a gap year this past year. And like other college students, she had to come home early. But I was realizing it hadn't even been a year yet since we did that. I'm like, oh my goodness. And that got me thinking about the weekend that we did drop her off and uh, the expectations in my heart. And it was so awesome, the team of people there that we got to meet uh, that she was gonna spend this year with. It was really, really amazing. People were unloading boxes and helping us carry it up. And we thought that was gonna be the worst part of it, but it was the easiest part of it. And we got to experience what a lot of you have who've dropped college students off. It was pretty amazing. We get to stand in the room and help her decorate. And you know, she didn't know a lot of people yet in the first few hours. So she's kind of really kind of clinging to us and I'm liking that as a dad and we're having a lot of fun. We're eating out uh, a few meals and sharing blessings and, 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 and getting a chance to pray over her. And 99.9% and of the weekend was this amazing experience. It was all that I could have hoped for. But then that last point percentage point happened. The few last remaining hours and I kind of emotionally was prepared for the Dillashaw version of the Last Supper. You know, not, not like that, you know, there was anything miraculous gonna happen, but that we were gonna share a meal and probably even some tears, and I was gonna be able to speak some blessings. I'm, I'm emotionally preparing myself for this, but I'm standing in her dorm room watching her talk to these new friends, watching her engage these people and they're talking about going over here and getting this and buying this and hanging it over here and we should go try out this place and I'm looking at the expression of her face and I can get emotional about it even right now because my heart was, was recognizing that as a daddy, I'm gonna have to sacrifice this moment, this expectation that I have for all that's going to happen in the next few hours. I'm gonna have to sacrifice it for what's best for her. And you see, we all are in those moments. Those are our midnight hours when our expectations come face to face with reality and the expectation was here and reality is now here. And it somehow gives the enemy this back door into our lives to shout really loudly. And sometimes he might use a truth. Most of the time he uses a lie. But every time, it's to take your eyes off of Jesus and what Jesus wants to do in your midnight hour. But you see, there's a second thing I want you to see. And it's right before midnight is when, we as the church have to recognize that right before midnight is when the world is watching. Quickly, I want you to recognize, we didn't get a chance to read it, but at the end of verse 14, we see that the Lord had opened Lydia's heart. Luke is reminding us about how it is that Lydia came to know Jesus. It tells us that as Paul was talking, the Lord opened her heart to what? To pay attention to what was said by Paul. So she's watching, it's clear in the text. And then skip down to verse 19. Remember those business guys that owned the slave girl that was following Paul and Silas around? Check this out, verse 19. But when her owners saw, so they're paying attention, saw that their hope of gain was gone their midnight hour, their brokenness, their bank account is going to be empty because their hope of gain was gone. They seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers, had them beaten with rods and then thrown into prison. And I'm reading that this week. I'm thinking, what's the difference in the two scenarios? I mean, put your Captain, Habit hat, Captain Obvious hat on. It's clear from the text that God was at work in Lydia's life. Luke tells us so. But there's, a thing, there's something that I want you to see that's a little deeper. And as you begin to ask the question, God, why were you at work in Lydia's life and not at work in those slave owners' lives? It seems to me, God, that if you had been at work in their lives, then maybe, just maybe, the whole village, the whole town of Philippi would have responded to you. And I wanna encourage you, anytime you have a question like that, go deeper in the text. Ask the Holy Spirit, ask Jesus to give you eyes. Don't just stop there. Don't go, oops, that's the weird God, the God that I wanna put in the closet, the God that's unexplainable. No, there's something still here in the story, in the text, that God wants to reveal to you. And it's about the foundation that Paul and Silas were standing on. Because you see, they knew in the midnight hour or right before midnight, the world would be watching. 
You see, and Lydia, Lydia recognizes that she's already in the story of God, the larger story of God. She believes in a God, she just doesn't know about Jesus. And because of that, she's able to to recognize it as Paul and Silas would explain the gospel to her. And so you, church, all of us, we gotta realize that there are people in our story today that that they haven't yet begun to sing their song of hope, but it's stirring. It's stirring because they know about God, they just don't know about Jesus. And God is bringing you through a midnight hour. God's gonna gonna write a song of hope on your heart so that you can walk your neighborhood and you can engage people and you can begin to sing that song of hope and you can be like Paul and Silas were, like as they engaged Lydia, and you can begin to share the story of Jesus with somebody for the very first time and their heart will become, their, their heart will awaken to their own song. God wants to use you. But you see, there's also the opposition. There's people that don't know yet. And you see, there's a song of hope that we have to be willing to sing even in the middle of opposition. And the foundation that Paul and Silas laid for us, the understanding that I believe God wants to give to us, is you see, we would later find out if we read the whole story today, the whole chapter today, read it if you have time, we find out that Paul could have played the Roman citizen card immediately, right? We see it at the end. The guys are like, oops, you're a Roman citizen. Uh, Maybe we shouldn't have done that. Can we have a do-over? And they apologize and let Paul and Silas go. But see, Paul didn't play the card at the beginning of the conversation. Why didn't he? Because you see, Paul had already been through more than one midnight hour. Paul already knew what his song of hope was. He understood the sovereign hand of the Lord God Almighty will meet me in this moment, and God is after more than just my freedom. God is after more than just me feeling comfortable in this moment. God, Jesus, will glorify his name as people. I have their eyes open to God at work. There never would have been an earthquake. The jailer never would have come if Paul plays the Roman citizen card at the very beginning of the conversation. And believer, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, You've got a song to sing at midnight. You've already been through, like Paul, one midnight hour because you've come face to face with the fact that if you died apart from Jesus, you would split hell wide open. But one day somebody explained that to you. And because you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you'll spend eternity with him. You've already been through one midnight hour. Will you use this one to sing your song of hope? So come on, church. Today is an opportunity for us to step in and begin to sing our song of hope. You know, um, at the Dillashaw home, there is, we have a quarantine project. It's only like 2%, uh, uh, it's in progress, but we've only got to like the 2% mark. Uh, We started to do some work in our backyard. I think probably some of you have started to do the same thing. And um, I was noticing yesterday uh, the horrible lack of progress that we've made. But just to quickly tell you, we live backed up to a road that's backed up to a neighborhood. And before that road and before that other neighborhood existed, when we bought our house, we planted some red tips and they grew tall. And so it kind of created this insulation from this activity that was gonna become behind. But after 15 years, those red tips die, most of them in the middle. And so we began in the middle of this quarantine deal to cut them down. But what I also need to share with you is we have a porch and on this back, in in our backyard and on this porch is where I often go to spend time with Jesus, to verbally process what I'm even sharing with you and what I do for Wednesday nights with, with with our teenagers. And so I'm just walking around yesterday, praying, singing my song of hope, talking, talking out loud. And it dawns on me that my neighbor uh, in, that's behind me, he's in his garage. I can see into his garage and he's working on his car. I can hear their conversation, can't quite make up the words. And it dawns on me every now and then, I see him come out to the edge, I kid you not. And he's looking at me. And I bet, like the other prisoners were wondering what Paul was singing, I think he's figuring out what's that crazy guy doing in his backyard? He's just pacing back and forth. Kind of looks like he's even talking out loud. So I just wave at him, he waves at me, and I keep doing it. I keep walking around, verbally processing, praying for you, praying for this time. He comes out a second time and I wave. Happened, I kid you not, three different times throughout that next hour. Not close enough where we could have a conversation yet, yet um, close enough where he could see me, I could see him, and we could wave to each other. 
And you see, the blessing of this whole thing is that people don't think that's crazy anymore, right? There's a dude that, that, that knows that I pace in my backyard and he doesn't, he probably doesn't think it's crazy anymore. You can sing your song as you walk your streets this week. You can sing your song as you drive in a car and maybe even roll down a window and wave to somebody and pull out your mask a little bit and say, hey, Jesus loves you. You can be prepared to sing your song because the world is watching. The question is, what song are we gonna sing, church? I got to thinking about that too. And that brings us back to that right hook. Hope sings loudest at midnight. And I wondered this week, I wonder what Paul and Silas were singing. I mean, they didn't have Brian McCleary and Chain Breaker. If I'd have been there, I think that's what I'd been singing. Or maybe there's another one in the fire. I don't know what I'd be singing, but I wondered what Paul and Silas were singing. I wondered what their midnight song was. And as I got to process that this week, one of the things I felt like the Lord said, and here's, here's the place where, where I think hope begins for many people today, is that you, you won't know your song, the song that you're gonna sing in your midnight hour until you embrace your midnight hour. Let me say that again. Because hope is springs eternal. Hope is gonna be birthed in this moment. You won't really know the song that God's writing on your heart for your midnight hour until you embrace your midnight hour. That's why song, Paul and Silas could sing even while those jail, the people in jail thought they were crazy. You see, today, I just have to tell you that I had the song of hope. You see, there was this weird, um, weird overlapping for me of some emotional um, experiences during quarantine, at the beginning of quarantine, because um, at the beginning of quarantine, the anniversary of my oldest brother's passing and his birthday kind of overlapped. And I don't share this story a lot because it's largely been something that the Lord has let me put behind me. But every now and then I realize that it is something that screams really loud at me. That it is something that the enemy wants to use and twist and distort and cause me to take my eyes off of Jesus. And quarantine caught us as a church and I was busy helping prepare the, the, the church and our Sunday morning experience and I didn't even realize that, that I was in the middle of this anniversary yet one day just woke up and felt like, man, I'm being taken down for the count. The only thing that I, I could think of was, I'm in, in the middle of some spiritual warfare, called a friend, talked to my wife, just nothing seemed to make it better for about 24 to 36 hours. And I told you about my porch. Just found my way to that porch, crying out to God, and that didn't even seem to matter in that moment. But you know what happened next? God took me back to a song that I learned as a teenage boy, a song by Dennis Jernigan. Who can satisfy my soul but you, Jesus? There's none like you, Jesus. No one on this earth can satisfy my soul like you, Jesus. And I put my, my ear pods in and I cranked it up really loudly and I paced back and forth and my midnight song became my song that day. On Monday in that midnight hour, oh, by the way, it was just 6.30 in the morning, but it was midnight. Do you get it? And I sing it again at 5.30 on that Tuesday. And again at 12.30 p.m. on that Wednesday. And again, at 4 p.m. on that Thursday, my, my midnight song became my declaration. And you gotta know this morning, church, that when you embrace your midnight hour and God reveals to you your song, you're gonna sing it, you're gonna sing it loudly, and hope, hope is gonna come. And so we're gonna do that this morning. But before we do, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta challenge you. Because your midnight song, just like Paul and Silas, is not just for you. It's for your neighborhood. It's for your coworkers. It's for the people that, that you come in contact. Last week, Pastor Kirk introduced us to this challenge, this challenge that we, we might be a church praying for our neighborhoods, praying for our oikos. And so before we process our song right now, church, I wanna ask you, will you sign up? Will you step into this moment and, and say, hey, I, I, I get it, Chris. My midnight song is not just for me. It's to be declared for the world to hear. Would you join the rest of us? You can text the word America to 77411. 
I get it, I know we ask you to do a lot of that. It's the only way we know that you're out there. Join the team, agree with me today. You've seen it clearly from the text. Your midnight song is not just for you. God wants to use it in your in this hour to, to, to declare his glory for your neighborhood, for your coworkers, for the people that, that you come into encounter with. Because they see you, the world is watching. But I also get it. Right now, you're about like, Chris, maybe next week, but I'm where you were. I'm in that moment where it was new information to me that I might be listening to a lie. It's new information to me that I might be listening to a, to, the, to a different voice. If that's you today, I wanna to invite you in to do what I did, to just stand wherever you're at and embrace a song, an old song. But you see, the word of God reminds us over and over again to declare his goodness and to receive his goodness. And when God's children respond in that, it says, the Bible says, that he will move heaven and earth for you. And so today, today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, step into this moment. As Brian and the guys lead us in this declaration, would you, would you maybe reach out and talk to somebody? Maybe somebody you know that's a Christian. Or if you need to, if you need to talk to somebody today, you can text the word LIFE to 77411 and we'll have a conversation with you today.